can stay. Um, we're going to be recording this and it will be available on YouTube after the fact. So if there's something you need to refer back to or whatever, you will get the link in the follow up email for this. Good morning, Sarah. Um, anybody that came in previously, if you could make sure to put your name into the chat window so I have that record of you being here and can get your LEUs to you. And then we'll go ahead and get started. Okay. Oh, those of you that just came in, you missed my dream about Donald Trump. I'm pretty sure you're sad about that. Ask me later. It's not on the recording, which I'm kind of sad about. Anyway, so let's go on to the actual thing. I put together this um, cool little, is it cool? I don't know if it's cool. Thing related to the feedback that uh, people provided about this topic of interest being realia and, and kits. And um, I thought it was really interesting. It kind of made me want to go back into public libraries just because these are fun things and it would be fun to be a part of. Um, that's probably not a good reason to go back and do it. So I apologize if this is difficult to read. I really like the background and I thought, huh, the background is cool, but it makes um, the actual text not great. So I'll choose better next time. So these are examples of some of the things that are being circulated in Evergreen Indiana libraries. Um, and you can read through all of those. And I know that there are some other things. I put on that the Oculus Quest, which that's a cool thing and anyway, but I know that there are other technology type things that are also uh, being cataloged and then circulated to your communities. Um, I was also thinking about these things that some of these um, some of these actually will circulate through Info Express and some of them won't. So, um, and that may be something, maybe something we talk about this morning or, or not. So is there anything that is not on this list? And you can, you can see right here where I uh, obviously lost my, my train of thought and just kind of stopped that thought. There's no closed parentheses. This all happened about like 9.30 this morning. So my apologies for just kind of going by the seat of my pants on that. But are there examples of things in your library that um, are not on this list? And you can either unmute yourself and talk or you can put it into the um, chat box. So Sarah says that um, they circulate umbrellas in baskets. What do you mean by baskets? They're baskets for people to carry their stuff home in, so they're big plastic baskets. Oh, so they, they take them home and then they, that's kind of cool. Yeah. Yeah, the friends bought them years and years ago, and actually just last year they replaced them all with like new ones with our new. So books. they check those out as an item? Um, yeah, they check them out as an item and take them home with, it, it works great for people that have, you know, hundred, like a hundred books. Yeah, yeah. Do, do they have wheels on them? Nope, handles. They're basically pretty much like the baskets you have in the grocery store. Okay, sure. Shopping baskets. Mm -hmm. Here at Peabody, can you hear me? Um, I can hear somebody. Who am I oh, hearing? Christy. This is Christy at Peabody. We hey. have we have rolling baskets that have handles, sort of mm -hmm. that telescope up. And do you, and do you check those out? We check them out, <sighs> and then we also a couple of the unique things we have is um, we have a set of bongo drums. I have two ukuleles to catalog right now. Okay. Um, a green screen. Okay. And we have a ghost hunting kit that has. I forgot about ukuleles. 
how could I ever <laughs> but forget that? But I think that she's she's looking at more musical instruments, just not ones that require mouthpieces. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Thank you for that. <laughs> so sorry, that just struck me as like the grossest thing ever to circulate musical the instruments and mouthpieces. Cool. I mean, it probably, I mean, I know there are ways to clean them, but like if you have a trumpet, it's metal, you can clean that, but still, yuck. Anyway, you don't do it, so it doesn't matter. So ukuleles, oh, well, ghost hunting kit and bongo drums. That's cool. Anybody else have some things that are, are not listed on there? I love the, the shopping baskets idea is just almost like, duh. Oh yeah, tons of us have hot spots. Oh yeah, hot spots. I guess that would go next to the Oculus Quest as another, I mean, or its own item. Yes, hot spots. I think that's one of those, of go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say a lot of equipment type things are, they sort of are, uh, fall into this category. Equipment's almost its own category. Yeah, it, it is hotspots and projectors and it, it almost depends on those local decisions on laptops. how that, What was the other thing? Oh, I said laptop. Oh, laptops. Are there at libraries here that circulate laptops to go outside of the buildings? I mean, I know that that is a physical possibility. We, we don't, we just thing. bought some that we're planning to use inside the building only. Although I don't, now, now it's kind of on hold. So I don't even know when we're going to do that. They're like brand new <laughs> because nobody has touched them. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, we were like planning to roll it out like the week we shut down. <laughs> It'll happen and it will be cool. It, it, all of these things that got put on pause, it was really just that. They're just put on pause and, and yeah. So, oh, that, that actually did that without me doing anything. I have the touchiest mouse ever. Um, so we know that there are these things and they are a lot of fun. Uh, Megan says that we do not let laptops leave the building, but we do circulate Kindles. Oh, park passes. How are park passes not on that list? So I know that some people, obviously, Kayla says that um, Newberg is circulating um, the park passes. I know that some people stopped circulating them after the bicentennial um, because the, the program itself was discontinued. Are there other libraries represented here besides Kayla that still continue to um, circulate the park passes? We have local passes that we circulate. So museum passes, like Indiana State Museum or? We have the Idle Jord too. Okay. And is that something that you guys have you have purchased those to circulate them? Or is that part of a, a program? I'm not sure the programs that are going on right now, if there are any. The Idle Jorg, I know we've purchased. I don't remember about the State Museum. That might be a program. They had continued that a few years. Kayla, what um, local, what are some examples of some local park passes that you circulate? Like, are they for state parks or are they for, for something else? Oh, the, Auburn, so that would be an example of a local, the Auburn Ford, Leslie Woods Park. Oh, okay. So patron donation for some of those. Science Central, what is Science Central? Is that a, um, I'm assuming it's a local thing, like maybe a STEM organization in the Science Museum in Fort Wayne. So a lot of local, um, passes that that's really, really cool that those are continuing on in a, in a more localized, locally applicable way. I know that one of the challenges with the Indiana State Museum passes when I was in Hagerstown is 
the people that would be borrowing them would be in Hagerstown. And so that it would have to be like this big deal for them to actually use it. We're going, we have to go to Indianapolis, which I mean, is really like an hour and a half away, not terribly big deal in, in terms of travel speak, but when you're, it, but then it kind of is, when you think about going out of the rural environment. And so a lot of those really practical and local things, and then some more um, tactile things like the bike locks and cake pans and kits of every imaginable type was it. So when we were talking about the challenges, the feedback that I got related to that was not surprising and had mostly to do with creating mark records um, because those, because they're not um, this mass distributed type thing that comes from Baker and Taylor with this, this pre written mark record and so it then puts all of the burden for description and access access onto the cataloger so these were um the comments that that came back creating the mark records correctly inputting information for the 300 tag and and one thing i didn't put here but i thought about then is also correctly inputting information for the 500s um, as you're summarizing the description for that um, the best practices for how to measure and describe. I thought that it was funny where to put the barcode. I mean, it sounds like the simplest thing ever, but it is not. It's never, these, not with these things. Where do you, how do you put a barcode on a cake pan that's gonna go in the oven? So you can't do, well, I mean, you could do that, but so then you have to decide, are, are you gonna have some card that's associated with that? Are you gonna put it in a bag that has a barcode on it? And all of that differs. I mean, there isn't a best practice in Evergreen, Indiana. All of it differs based on local decisions. So what are some things that y'all have to say about that? I can't really even, even guide that with a better question than that because it's just su such a big thing. For Mary the umbrellas, says, we used luggage tags, which actually has worked really well. And, and and you have those attached to the umbrella. Yep. Yeah. And one of the factors for us too with, with barcodes and realities is, is if things are gonna self-check, because our self-check machines have the scanners like mounted, and so people have to be able to get the barcode. Being actually through. under the barcode scanner. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's a really good consideration. Has anybody, decided not to circulate something because they couldn't figure out how to, not about the mark record, but how to actually get it shelf ready and check outable. Has anybody made that decision on a thing? Okay. Does it, I'm getting absolutely no feedback on that. So I'm assuming everybody's like, okay. no, we're gonna do this. So we're gonna figure out a way to make it work. Which is legit. I mean, that's 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 what what libraries do. <laughs> Librarians I mean, do. It's definitely a factor. Like one of the reasons that we aren't doing board games, even though we're kind of interested, is just that all of those little pieces and keeping track of them and the amount of work it would be for the circulation staff is daunting. And so it's not so much the cataloging, but the whole like getting it ready for the shelf and making it easy for the staff to deal with. So some of you who actually do circulate board games, because I know that there are people in here that do, how do you deal with um, that aspect of it saying, okay, well, I have Monopoly and it has like seriously thousands of fake dollars in here and how do I maintain that? Do I care? Um, what about this chessboard that has these pieces? Um, how do you deal with that in terms of circulating those board games? Here at Peabody, we mostly use the luggage tags for okay. everything. Um, like the only thing, a few things can't have luggage tags. Our canner, 
Um, we do, for every item though we circulate, um, let's, um, we have a, a card that's probably five by seven and it's, it's on bright yellow paper and it describes the item and tells what's inside. Um, and this, this includes all of our lawn games that go out and all the board games. And so it lists all the pieces so that that's also helpful. And then in, on the back, sometimes I include pictures for the circulation desk people so that they can tell what's checking out. Um, but we check out um, some of the things I forgot, especially lawn games. We have croquet and badminton, volleyball and can-can and um, just a whole bunch of them and a giant Jenga game and... Um, so are circulation staff responsible for checking for all those pieces when they come back? Yes. Okay. And they charge and it, and on the card also says there will be a cleaning fee charged if if the item comes back really dirty. But oh, we have cornhole. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, it's it's pretty popular too in the summer. Right now unfortunately none of those items are circulating because of the amount of stress that it would put on the staff to clean and do all that kind of stuff. But um, if it's not on a luggage, if the barcode isn't on a luggage tag, it's usually on that laminated paper that tells what the item is and you know how long it circulates and then all the, the all the you know details about the item and it's on that paper. Uh, Heidi has a, a, I think, I mean for me this is this is a good thing to have in there. They leave a slip of paper and the clear tote um, for. I'm assuming this is for games or, or for puzzles or really for whatever that asks the patrons if there are missing pieces as well so that that can be, there can be some division of labor between the CERC staff is still going, going to have to check it, um, but maybe that alleviates some of the guesswork. At least maybe they know what they're looking for in some cases and that can be documented. Um, and Linda says they, they do something similar. They list the parts and then they put um, a note asking for patrons to check carefully that all the parts are in the box when they return it. And most of their games have been donated, so we've not really lost anything if something gets lost. So Megan says, circulation used to check for all the pieces. The kids department now checks for all the pieces and then gives it back to CERC to check in if the pieces are there. So I'm assuming in my head from this workflow that rather than check it in instantly, it goes to um, the children's department for them to, to check it over, and then it comes back to CERC for that. Okay. And then any CERC item, Heidi says, any CERC item that would have essential items um, that need to be put in the item to have full use. And there's, and then keeping spare parts is um, one of the things that we dealt with at Hagerstown. Um, so Jennifer Taylor is not in this meeting, but she, um, but I, I know Hagerstown circulates stuff there because they did it, started doing it while I was there. Um, including the ukuleles, which is why I had that moment. I was like, how could I forget ukuleles? It, it has so many ukuleles. Uh, but the games that they, they circulate have a picture of the game, the pieces that are in it, the instructions for use, and that's laminated. Um, it goes along with it. But we had at one point um, the Minions version of a game. I don't even remember what the game itself was. It might have been Monopoly, but it, it was the Minions version. And so it was a, the pieces were highly desirable as far as not wanting to be returned. And so, um, and then there was another game that the pieces for whatever reason just kept on getting lost and, and she, herself is a, a gamer, a board gamer. And so she um, had some hookups with places to get replacement pieces, some 
some of those more um, unique things rather than just like the, the little game pieces that go like with the game of sorry or whatever. Um, so we did that, but then there's a point where you're like, oh, well, how many times do we have to replace this? And yeah, anyway, I, I don't know that that has anything to do with cataloging aspect of it, but um, definitely has to do with the whole use of the item throughout the, the, the um, the cycle of libraries, so the circulation, cataloging, and then circulation, all of that. Um, a question that I have that I didn't actually put on here is how much time do are you willing to spend on these items in terms of creating that mark record, describing it? Um, not just for the basic requirements, but for good patron access, because we, we want them to actually be able to find it, not just to have the, a record in there, but to have a good record so people can find it. How much time do you spend um, on some of these more difficult items that don't have a lot of information available? I love cataloging Realia. <laughs> For real? Oh, I do. I, okay. I do. But, you know, I, everybody knows I'm a big cataloging nerd, so. <laughs> oh, in a room of cataloging nerds, here you go. I, I just think it's the most fun because it's, like, creative. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it, that It's not like everything else where there's really, a, like, very firm set rules. It's, it's, you have to figure out how to make it fit into the mark record and where you can describe it in a way that is clear and um, gets the information across about the item and makes it discoverable. Um, I, I, I just think it's really fun. What, what do other people think? I don't spend too much time on Realia just because it's fun for me. I, I, I mean, really, I this, is a, this is a very open-ended question. We know that there are no like rules other than maybe you have some institutional rules. But Evergreen Indiana is certainly not coming in and saying, hey, you can only spend 10 minutes creating this record for this item. I mean, I, I, I just mean too much time in terms of my time could maybe be better spent elsewhere. <laughs> again, that's between you and the powers that be. <laughs> what, how, what do other people think? Because I know that this, this the time and the joy that you can get out of doing this also depends on your role. And there are, there are people in here who don't get to, to dedicate all their time to cataloging either. Um, so if you're spending a lot of time on the circulation desk, you're also not just thinking about the cataloging of the item, but you're thinking about um, all, and not just checking it out either, but how it does impact circulation staff and other things um, in, in a more, in a more, in a very practical sense, um, as opposed to a, a theoretical sense. Um, so what do you think? I'm shutting up right now. I guess I feel I've been lucky um, with I use bookware a lot, and so I find similar records if I can't find the exact item. Um, I'm amazed how many board games Indiana University owns or has in their catalog, <laughs> because I've found a lot of the board games there. Um, my one struggle is when, th when they purchase things off of Amazon is trying to find where the publisher actually resides, <laughs> especially if it's foreign. <laughs> but that's just a, sometimes ends up at least a publication unknown. But, but those, that's probably my biggest struggle is the place of publication. And sometimes the date isn't there either. Uh, it can often end up 2020, question mark. <laughs> right. I don't know. 
Is Shelly at this? I can imagine the situation. So it, uh, it, it, that's what I was laughing at. A <laughs> hundred years ago, we in Colsa, so it dates it a little bit, cataloged rocks for the children's museum. We laughed longer than it took to catalog them. I can imagine. I mean, I'm still actually laughing about it and had no part to play in any of it but the cataloging of rocks. And I can imagine it was actually pretty fun to do that as well. Today, we will catalog rocks. We will describe what type of rock it is and the size of it. And it'll... oh my goodness sakes, librarians are awesome. Anyway, I'm gonna scoot on this. So um, thank you to Monica Boyer this goes back to the um, the mark, and she had a, a good tip, I would say, as far as those um, creating mark uh, records, because a lot of times they are going to be from scratch. Of course, you, you get the Evergreen Indiana templates for the marks, um, but it doesn't have any information in it. It just has the fields that you should hopefully use, but of course, within that that genre of kits or realia, there's still so much diversity that sometimes. Oh, there's Monica right now. She heard she heard me over the internet say her voice. Let me see if Monica, we're talking about you right now. Um, she uh, created or included this this tip uh, how she handles um, creating mark and saving his text file using the flat text editor which I'm a huge fan of the flat text editor I I suspect that most people that have to do any bulk not batch but bulk um, cataloging of of things where you are doing a lot of copy and paste or you you just get used to actually selecting and deleting text rather than using helper um, menus and things like that like the flat text editor i i'm old man and, and i think that 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 format makes me happier than <laughs> maybe somebody that's younger i don't know i could just be making that up and it may be a very ageist thing for me to say so I apologize if you're young and you love the flat text editor, or if I just called you out as old, that's possible too. Anyway, here it is. This will be actually available to you. I'll, I'll include this very small um, slide deck in the follow-up email so you'll have this workflow documented there as well. And so just a step-by-step -step, um, of what she described in terms of um, kind of automating, it's not really automating, but, but using copy paste to make less work for you. So is there um, something else that you may do um, that comes to mind that makes this process makes the lame parts of this process less lame. Um, any hints or tips or processes or things that have made your um, life a little bit easier? Just kind of following along in the chat. Anita, I, I, I like your comment, better learn to enjoy it. I think that, that that's a, a point of wisdom as we get older, there are things that are unpleasant. I'm not saying that cataloging is one of them, but there are just things that are unpleasant. And there's a point where you're like, okay, this is never going to end. I mean, it's gonna keep happening. And um, I have a choice to be annoyed by it every single time or to find the thing in it that makes it okay um, or even good <laughs> preferably even good because then it's going to not stink so much <laughs> but 
fun. Well, cataloging, yes. I'm just thinking in general. <laughs> One of the things that I have found, and, and I will, would encourage you if you don't have the opportunity, sometimes you have power over this and sometimes you don't, is that cataloging is always more enjoyable when you can just do it when you're not distracted by other things, when you don't have to multitask, which is just a bunch of baloney anyway. Um, but if you can carve out a good chunk of time, not half an hour, but two hours, or something to, to say, I'm, I'm just not available at this point unless the, the building is literally burning down. The, it has to be something of that level to interrupt. It can't be, oh, I have a stomach ache. Okay, well, great. Tell somebody else, or maybe that is the building burning down if that's the only staff person there with you. But shut your door, make it the environment that you want it to be, and just catalog that thing without outside distractions. Um, because that does make it more enjoyable, lets you kind of get into the flow of you and whatever that item is um, that you need to describe, you need to create this record for. And as far as learning to enjoy it goes, there is that, but then also remembering why you're doing it and determining if you care about it. Um, not the item, but if you care about the why, um, which is there's this thing that we believe that the patrons can use for whatever. And this is books, this is realia, whatever. We believe that it, it is good for them. They will enjoy it. They will be better for it, whatever. And the job of the cataloger is to make it discoverable so that they know that this thing exists and they can have access <coughs> to it. Then, once we've determined that, do we care? Do I care that they have access to it? There are days, let me tell you, I do not. And that is one reason I am not a great cataloger. I'm not a great cataloger anyway. But there are days when I'm a bad one because I don't care about that. There are other things pulling at my attention. There are other just other things and maybe I'm maybe I'm just grumpy there are days when I'm grumpy about them like you know what you have treated my staff like just crap you have treated my director like crap you have said bad things to the newspaper okay I'm conflating a bunch of situations here my day has never actually been that bad with all of those things but that's probably not the best day to be thinking about patrons discovering a thing because it'll be difficult to do your best work there when, when you, if you're trying to keep that mindset, we're doing this for the patrons. Right. Anyway. This is actually a legitimate question about whether or not you care if someone discovers this because some things you really aren't concerned about discoverability within the That's catalog true. and you just care that you're making a record to enable it to be checked out and that discoverability is going to happen another way or maybe it's something that you don't actually really want the patrons to know you have and so that's, that's definitely fair have in the um public facing catalog and it but you need to be able to check it out for whatever reason. So those catalog records might look a lot different than something that you do want to be discoverable and will be public facing. So a question about that though, with that record, and this is me thinking about the database and the fact that we share the database. If you're creating a record and maybe your library doesn't care about discoverability, but somebody else is going to be dealing with the same item, um, the same whatever, and they do care about discoverability. Well, then is it, is it on the person that is initiating the record to make it as good as possible? Or does that come back to people going back into a record and editing it or creating a different record, which I'm, duh, anyway. Yeah, that's just yeah. me freaking out just a little for a second. 
I think that if, you know, you, I think you need to make sure it's clear what the item is so that the next cataloger can come along and say, oh, this is a record for what I need or this isn't. But it, it might not be as in-depth of a record if it's an, if for your patrons it's not discoverable. If the next pa cataloger comes along and says, this is a record for what I need, but I want my patrons to be able to find it, they might make it, they might expand the record. So what happens if they do that and that thing that you are kind of trying to obscure a little bit from your patrons all of a sudden becomes a little bit more accessible, not just to the other library, but to your patrons as well. Just roll with it. Make your items not OPAC visible. Well, and that's what I'm they trying to get to. Should we be level. using those type of tags and um, the holdings attributes to deal with that as opposed to the bibliographic record? I would question whether, I mean, I, I don't always put as much information as, as, I, and, as I can, and if somebody wants to enhance that later, go for it. Mm -hmm. But, and I, I agree with Sarah saying that some things don't need to be discoverable because I feel like um, you're putting a record in because it has to be there so they can check it out or because you expect them to, um, it to be more of a browsing thing. People aren't going to be looking in the catalog for it. They're going to find it on the shelf. Um, and so I don't know that it, but I don't know if there's ever a time that I want to make it undiscoverable. Um, well, it, maybe if it's for staff use only or it goes out only like via, um, your outreach staff and it doesn't get checked out from the building. Are you, answering, answering Eve's, are you answering Eve's question about an example of an item you don't want to be discoverable, Sarah? Yeah. Okay. And I, I think that Eve made a good, good question and I think Sarah had some good answers. Um, but I guess, I guess I would probably find it less, I wouldn't want the catalog record to be not discoverable. I want the item to be not discoverable. Of course. Well, and I don't mean that you're going to intentionally make the catalog record obscure, but that you're not going to spend it. If, if your items attached to the catalog record aren't OPEC visible, you're probably not going to spend a lot of time elaborating this mark record to make it discoverable, so to speak, so that people could search for it when even if they did search for it, it wouldn't show up because the items aren't OPAC visible. Right. It's going to be a more functional record. Yeah, I so in a room full of catalogers and librarians, catalogers being librarians, but then maybe librarians that are not catalogers, um, I, I kind of feel like as many people as are in the room are going to obviously be coming at it from their own perspective with their own um, value set that sometimes there's going to be some coalescence and sometimes there isn't. And, and that's, that's one reason we're doing this to, to understand the different perspectives here. Um, and not to say this is how you should be doing it, but this is how things are being done in different ways and, and can I subscribe to that for my own self or do I need to do something different? Anita has this comment here. We have hundreds of art prints and home decor items. Um, my helper doesn't have to stress about creating the ultimate mark. Nah. And, and I would say too, there isn't, unless there is, but there isn't often the time to create the ultimate mark for this. Oftentimes when these things come into the library, it, it's because there's going to be a new collection or, um, and so it's not just a one-off thing. You don't all of a sudden say, well, we've never done it before, but we're gonna circulate this one board game, um, or we're going to circulate this one cake pan, or we're going to circulate this, this one of anything. It's like, oh, we're creating this new collection. And so there are multiple things coming in 
that then there are multiple MARC records that have to be created. And so there isn't the time to create the ultimate MARC record for it anyway. Are you going to be going and searching through Library of Congress for all of the subject headings that could be going along with this thing? Are you going to be writing a summary on the Winnie the Pooh cake pan um, that describes which direction he's facing and is he or is he not holding a honey pot or, or whatever. Um, maybe you have time to go back and add that thing and you care about it, maybe, maybe you don't. And I don't know that it necessarily matters. Um, I think that if we are making things, then this again is just my opinion. If we are making things OPAC visible, then we have the assumption that somebody is going to be looking for it. Um, and if we think that they're going to be looking for it, we need to give them multiple entry points for it. Um, the, the other thing is there are a lot of things that our patrons don't go to the catalog for, because, but not because they shouldn't, because they just haven't traditionally and part of our marketing and our teaching of our, our patrons is to say, hey, this is something you can look for in our catalog, if we care about. It. Now, there are examples of things that we don't necessarily want them to discover, but I do, again, just my opinion, think that's something that needs to be handled with the, the item or the holding attributes. Do we make it OPAC visible? Do we make it holdable, whatever? Well, one thing I, I too I think about browsability and where when you think oh people are just going to be browsing for this inside the library and the catalog record doesn't matter as much like right now is a good time where people are going to be looking at the catalog a lot more right. than they might normally and browsing the library possibly a light a lot less and they might want to be able to make sure in the catalog that oh they have this thing that I need before they make that trip to the library or of course if you're only having curbside service then placing that on hold and that's another thing yeah. too do do we want to make those things and this is kind of that circulation cataloging hybrid um, where we're talking about the holdings attributes do we adjust whether they are holdable or not um, and then of course right now we're all also dealing with what is holdable versus resource sharing and all of those things. So um, I guess right now is not the greatest time to be talking about all of that stuff because it's some of it's just not working as expected. I mean, it's working, but it's not working as expected. Yeah. Um, and so things are being fixed on the daily, the minute by minute. Um, and I do, they're, none of them are in here, but I am going to give a shout out to Anna and to Bob and to Lynn who are handling all the, uh, the server side issues and making sure to turn those things on, things I have no access to whatsoever. And they, they have to do it using SQL queries and, and things. Um, anyway, and that's Bob and Lynn. And then Anna is managing the, the spreadsheet that rules the universe, um, that has everybody's information. Anyway, I could go on for days. Be gentle with them if you have the opportunity. <laughs> oh, and then by the way, the servers crashed this morning. They're back. So we have this, let me. What else? We have uh, just a few more minutes. Um, what else do you have to say about this? Um, questions you might have? My, my only comment here is that I, I think that it's an exciting thing that libraries continue to look for new things to support their patrons. Um, I, I know a lot of times the word innovative is thrown around which makes me just hate it just for the heck of the hating of the thing um yeah we could go into the psychological aspects of that but whatever um i think just from the diverse responses and that was that was like four or five people responding to that 
And so for those four or five people responding with such diverse um, things that are being circulated, I thought that that was really good because then I think about the people who didn't respond and what else goes into that. And that was exciting. And then the further responses from you in the chat as well. So shout out to libraries for being awesome. One thing that we, we really focus more on realia than kits um, mm -hmm. in this discussion. But one thing about kits that is that RDA is so much better for describing kits than AACR2 was because you have so many more options to put in information about the separate items. Um, I, there are a lot of things I don't love about RDA, but it's way better for kids question about that. Um, do you feel like the describability that is provided through RDA um, makes, takes away some of the need, I don't know if that's the right word, for conjoined items? Um, maybe, maybe because it makes it, it because you can repeat so many more fields than you used to be able to in terms of like individually describing the separate items in the kits um, that yeah you can before you have to decide, do, does it not matter before with kits you had to decide okay this is the main item in the kit and everything else is supporting it and mm -hmm. now you can give things equal treatment and so I think that, yeah, like, especially because I think conjoined items don't work very well. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with you. I mean, I understand why they exist and, and the intention, but I think that there are unintended consequences and implications from them. Um, that, but that's a topic of interest for another day. What else? That's a good comment about RDA and I actually wrote it down because I need to go and do some learning about that. Any other comments or questions you might have about kits or realia in your library or in Evergreen, Indiana? or Evergreen ILS. Okay, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, since I don't see any mics going off or any questions in here, I'm gonna, there's nothing wrong with ending a few minutes early. The next cataloging circle is going to be on June the 4th. The, the time is a little different because the cataloging committee meets that morning and so, um, if you have the opportunity that that will be televised live, it'll be over the internet. Um, I hit my mouse again, my apologies. And you haven't actually watched a cataloging committee meeting or been there, I would encourage you to. The um, link will be provided at some point, or if you don't find it, you can email me and I'll give you a link for it. Um, but it, a lot of work gets done in those meetings and it, it's very informative too as, as some of the workflows get ironed out and questions about manuals um, come up. And I think it's probably one of the most work intensive committees for Evergreen Indiana. So I would encourage you to be there and then um, participate if you have the time in the cataloging circle on that day in the afternoon. That's it. Thank you for everybody for participating. I will be sending out a, a, an email afterward. If you did not yet put your name in the chat window so I can make sure to have a record of you being here for your LEUs, please do that. Um, but if you talk at all, that counts as your name being in there. So if you've said anything in the chat window, you, there's a record of you but you can just put your name just to be sure if you want to. And I will give that a couple minutes. 
and we will call it. Thank you for participating. I appreciate you guys being here. Be safe, be healthy, wear your masks, stay home if you still can. If anybody would like to see a sample of what Peabody includes with their items, email me. And then Christy has put uh, her email address over in the chat. Is it, and it sounds like you, you have several pretty extensive workflows for that, Christy. So um, including the cards that you put out there, the, the luggage tags were mentioned more than once in different libraries. Monica has her mask on in her office. Nice. I'm in my house, so I don't have my mask on. It's me and the dog, who I did think was dead last night, but isn't yet. She's old. Anyway, inappropriate comment. So sorry. Between that and Donald Trump, James, what else could you ask for on this Thursday? This is why they keep me in an office rather than putting me out in public very often. Okay, I'm going to close it down. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day.